Welcome to Christ Chapel College, the college outreach of Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We hope everyone experiences what Jesus calls abundant life. So we unapologetically point to Him as the source of life and joy. If you're a college student in the Fort Worth area, we'd be stoked to connect with you. Find out more at ChristChapelCollege.org and on Instagram at Christ Chapel College. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you are here. My name is Ben, and I'm one of the pastors uh, at Christ Chapel. And uh, yeah, like Asher said at the very beginning, I love what he uh, what he said to welcome us, uh, him and Lexi both. Um, and I heard him mention this multiple times, even this morning, and he said it before. Uh, we are not a museum of perfect people. That's not what this is. That's not what that's not what a worship service is. It's a museum of a bunch of people who show up and, and look our best and, and try to kind of put on the mask. Uh, we are a hospital for broken people. That's really what we believe, who we believe we are. And uh, if you've been around us, um, if you're new, then welcome, seriously. If you've been around us for a while, you know we boast in that. We boast in the fact that we aren't people who have it all together, who have fixed it and, uh, and have figured it all out. Um, we boast in the fact that, man, we are imperfect people, but that God is doing a work in us, that he's not leaving us where we are, that we don't boast in sitting in our, in our sin and our brokenness, but we boast in a God who takes broken people um, and invites them to the table, even though we don't deserve it. And so that's what we are about, um, and that's who we are. And uh, I want to start there um, this semester, and even as we kick off not only this sermon, but really the beginning of this year, uh, really just making sure you know our heart of who we are and what you walked into. Um, and it's going to tie to the series that we're in in chapter 11. But I want to start, too, with where do we get that from? This idea that you don't have to fake it when you walk into this room, that this room is a place that somebody who had a horrible Saturday night or somebody who's had an awful year or somebody who doesn't necessarily even believe what we believe yet still can belong to this community and sit at the table and learn and grow. And by the grace of God, our prayers, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they would come to know who they really are and whose they really are. And, and one of the places that we get that is um, a pretty popular verse in Ephesians chapter 2. And it's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. And so really, this is what we hang our ministry and really our lives on is this idea that it is by grace you have been saved, which means if you come from a really religious background, right, or, or maybe a, a very legalistic uh, church background that had a lot of rules and, and you kind of bought into a system uh, where you thought, okay, I've just got to do all of the good things. There's a, there's a scale of good and bad and the works, right, the good deeds are my works, and I need to put enough pebbles on that scale to tip it in my favor as opposed to doing bad things and the things that I'm called from Scripture to not run to and to not turn to but instead do more works. And, and this verse, and really the Bible, if you study it, blows up that notion that that is a broken notion, that that is an anti-gospel. That is not the gospel. The gospel that we believe that this book preaches, that we build our ministry and personally my life on, and hopefully your life on is this idea that you are saved by grace, not of works, not of works, but by grace, that the grace of God is what saved you. Not that you're good enough or churchy enough or Christian enough or pure enough, but God was gracious. And he's a father who looks at you and says, I love you. And you say, but all I have is brokenness and sin and I'm not worthy. And he says, yeah, I know, I know, and I love you. And I'm calling you out into something better. That is who we are. That is what we believe. And the implications of being grace people means a ton for this room. And hopefully it means a ton for your life. It means that every Sunday, if you come into this place, it means you don't have to fake it. Right? It means you don't have to fake it. It doesn't mean you have to pretend. It doesn't mean you have to try to sing the songs to earn something, um, to try to check a box of church attendance so that God will be more pleased, so it's a, a pebble in your favor. Um, you don't have to fake it. There's plenty of things also um, that are going to keep you from a deeper walk and a re deeper relationship with the God of the universe that you are designed for. And there's a ton of things throughout college, throughout your life that are going to get in the way and try to, try to slow that growth down in, in your relationship with Christ. But what this means, what Ephesians 2 8, 9 means is that shame doesn't have to be one of those things that keeps you from a relationship with Christ. That the shame of feeling like I'm not good enough or I, if 
only you knew what I struggled with or where I've been or what I've done, that those things, because of Ephesians 2 8 9, because of all of Scripture, because of who Christ is and what he's done in the gospel, that he paid for all of that. But that's what we believe. There should be incredible freedom and confidence to be able to approach him and let him change us. Um, that's pretty incredible. That's who we are. Um, we are broken people who have a God who loves us where we are and calls us to something better. We'll never grow tired of saying that uh, in this room and really in relationship with, with us as a ministry and hopefully in Christian community that you're in is marked by grace. God showed up 2,000 years ago in the person and work of Jesus Christ and he was perfect. And he lived the life that you should have lived. He lived the life I should have lived. And he died the death that I deserved and the death you deserved. And for those who put their faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, we get access to that table. We get access to that grace. And so that's, um, that's who we are. And, and we'll always preach that um, and we'll always talk about that here. Um, not because it's the doorway into Christianity, but really because it is the source of depth. Um, we believe in the gospel here, what I just talked about, this gospel of grace. We also believe that this should be a place where we go deep together as a community. We study scripture. We don't do a whole lot of topical series, although I think we're going to do one after spring break. But for the most part, we last year, we just preached through the book of Romans. Most of this year, we're going to be in Hebrews. Next year, we'll pick a book and we'll study it. We believe in going deep, and we believe that you're called to that. But depth is not different than the gospel. The gospel is your source of depth. Depth, as a believer, is taking God's word, digging deep in it, and taking the gospel and figuring out how it applies in deeper and deeper ways. If you're ever around a ministry and they're like, yeah, yeah, the gospel's good, but we really want to go deeper, and the gospel's just kind of the ABCs and we want to go deeper, run, run, right? That's what the Galatians had run into, right? Paul writes an entire letter in the New Testament to these people who were like, yeah, we got saved through the power of the gospel, but now we're ready to move on to other things. And Paul is like, what are you talking about? It is the application of the gospel of how you become deeper and deeper believers. And so you should find uh, freedom and excitement in that and also some caution. So back to Ephesians 2. I promise we're going to get to Hebrews. I promise. But first, Ephesians 2. Um, Please don't miss this. This is something really important. We're going to talk a lot about grace in this room every week. But look what it says. Because grace is not just a license to do whatever we want. For by grace, for by grace you have been saved, so good, through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing, it's a gift of God, right? Not a result of work so that no man can boast. There's this really, really important phrase in there, massively important, um, that we can't miss, that we're going to camp out on, and that all of our chapter in Hebrews is going to help us unpack. And it is this idea that, yes, we are saved by grace, but don't forget, we are saved by grace through faith. Right? That this idea of faith, we're not just saved by grace, and anyone who walks around is saved by grace. Scripture is pretty clear that there is a way to approach him. There is one way. Christ is the, the, the one way. He is the door, right? And no one comes to the Father except through faith in him. And so this is massively important. And we can hear and be encouraged by, wow, awesome. Hey, I'm saved by grace. No big deal. And then we can mistakenly use that grace as just kind of a license to do whatever we want and say, well, man, I heard this intro to a sermon and it talked a lot about grace and that he loves me where I'm at. So I just kind of have this get out of jail free card. But that's not what the verse says. Saved by grace through faith, which makes it really important. What does that mean? What does it look like to be in faith? If grace is this incredible free gift that we don't earn, this amazing gift that we desperately need and are given, it is activated by faith. Um, in, in my house, my boys are very confused by this, but um, we've got these TVs that don't just plug in. They're connected wirelessly through wireless routers, right? And so you turn on the TV, but oftentimes you have this one router that turns itself off. And I'm not sure why, and it's annoying, and I don't know why it does that exactly, but it gets hotter over time. It just goes into sleep mode. And so you turn on the TV, and, and the receiver is on in this, like, little entertainment closet thing, but there's no image coming to the TV because the router has turned itself off and so you got to go over to the cabinet and you just push the button and turn on the router and then all of a sudden the tv gets the signal and and my kids can watch netflix or whatever um that router right has to be activated 
right? That router has to route this idea of, okay, the image and the signal and the, the, the cancerous waves that float through my house, I'm not sure exactly how that works, has to be activated by this router. Faith is what activates grace in our life through faith. Guys, we better have a proper understanding of what faith is. If we want to claim Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 over ourselves and say, man, we're people under grace, awesome. Are we people of faith who are walking in that grace, who have received that grace, and who are growing in that grace? In order to answer that question of what really is faith, I think the best chapter in maybe all of at least the New Testament, in my opinion, is chapter 11 to defi- of Hebrews to define what is faith. What does this faith really look like? And so that's where we are. We've been preaching through the book of Hebrews. We finished up chapter 10 uh, right before Christmas break. And so that's where we're starting in chapter 11. And I'm going to take two weeks. I'm going to preach the first half of chapter 11 this week and the second half of chapter 11 and, and dig even a little deeper um, next week and, and maybe even have some, some special stuff that, that goes down. So Hebrews chapter 11 is where we'll be. We'll throw it up on the, the screen for sure, but if you got your Bibles, uh, I'd love for you to follow along. Hey, and if you don't have a Bible too, we would love to give you a Bible. We've got a really sweet family that's donated a bunch of Bibles. We've got like purple leather ESV Bibles, and we've got some Bibles around here. Just take one with you when you leave, unless it's somebody's. Like if it has somebody's name in it, don't do that. That's stealing, and that's mean. But if it's one of these Bibles that's on one of these tables, just grab it with you. We'd love for you to have that and, and be a gift to you. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to go through about the first half of this chapter. I'm just going to read the first three verses. Ready? Here we go. Now faith, here he starts to define it. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Let's stop right there. There is a definition here, and there's a lot to unpack that I won't be able to unpack all of, but I want to at least do one thing, at least in kind of sermon one this week, and that is to really zoom in on this idea that faith is this conviction. It's this confidence, right? Look look at verse one. It is the assurance of things hoped for, right? An assurance, a confidence. It is the conviction of things not seen. Um, and, And what is it referring to? It's the conviction and assurance of what? What things? Well, it's referencing the last 10 chapters of Hebrews. It's saying all of these 10 chapters that we studied last semester now lead to this idea of like faith is believing those things. And those things that we studied in a nutshell were the idea that Jesus is the perfect Uh, radiant glory of God in in the world, that Jesus was there at the creation. We believe that uh, Jesus is uh, the high priest that allows us to approach God, that Jesus is all-powerful and yet incredibly approachable to his people, That, that Jesus in the last 10 chapters we see is better than anything. He is better than anything. He's better than any system you could believe in. He's better than any, any coping mechanism you could have that Jesus is better at anything in your life and he is the better priest and source for satisfaction in your life. That's what the last 10 chapters laid out. And so then we get to chapter 11 and it says, okay, do you believe that? Do you really believe that Jesus is that and does those things? His promises are true, that he really is better than all of the other choices and ways that you can find satisfaction. And so then he starts to define that, and he gives back to the definition of faith. Um, he says, well, it's, it's the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. And I, I love that the definition of faith, that that's how he defines, the author of Hebrews defines the definition. He doesn't give a, a theological or technical definition he gives a definition that really, it really articulates how it should show up in our life. Let me explain it this way. Um, any botany majors in here? People who study plants, right? Maybe. Um, okay, so if I were to try to describe you, yeah, I know botany is hugely popular at TCU. Um, if I were to describe to you photosynthesis, and I were going to try to define for you how do plants grow, Right? There would be probably a very scientific definition that if anyone wants to take a crack at it, I'm certainly willing to let them take a crack on how you would scientifically define and explain through the scientific process what photosynthesis is and how plants grow and how the root system works and how the, the chlorophyll and all of that stuff works. Right? There's a scientific way to do that. Or you could say, hey, it grows by its leaves getting larger. 
It grows by, by its branches extending. And it's this beautiful idea that what he does here is he doesn't give you a scientific um, theological definition of faith. He says, hey, here's the result of what faith looks like. He says, if you have faith, it is an assurance of things hoped for. Faith is believing, not just believing, it's being, it's a confidence, right? It's a confidence. Faith produces assurance by, by really, I heard a pastor say this one time, and it stuck with me. Faith produces assurance by unlocking God's promises, right? Faith, it produces this assurance and this confidence in, in how I live now by unlocking the promises that God says of who he is and who I am in light of that and what he's done and the confidence I can have in his promises that he won't let me down, that he won't fail me. And it's not, be really careful, it's not do you have faith in yourself. It's not do you have uh, faith in who you are as a swell person and positive thinking. It's faith in what he says, his promises, that you're actually dead and broken in your sin, but that he is holy and perfect. And you bring nothing to the table, but he, through his grace, says you can still come. Do you believe me? Will you come? Will you surrender and come to me? Faith in Christ's promises It produces this confidence and peace. Faith produces a a few things. One, we see it produces confidence and peace in our life. And so if we think, well, do I have faith? I think a part of it is not confidence and peace being a work, right? A a thing that we do now to, to tip the scales in our favor, but confidence and peace being something to say, is there confidence and peace in the promises of God? Do I know them and do I believe them? Do I trust that his way is better Do I trust that his kingdom and how he desires it to run is better? Do I have confidence and peace in that? And if I do, then it's like, okay, look, God is producing faith in me. But also, um, you know, in this definition, it talks about conviction. So faith should also produce this conviction and this action, right? And so I think one of the ways that we determine, man, what does faith look like in my life is, man, is there conviction of things, assurance of things not seen and and this idea of, of conviction of things not seen and the assurance of things hoped for, um, is there action behind your walk with Christ? Is, is your walk with Christ, is your Christian, is your relationship with Christ something that is a, a category that happens on Sunday and maybe every once in a while you like journal or you go to something or you, do a, uh, you listen to some Christian music or is there actual action in your life that takes place? Things that you run away from that are sin, that God says I have something better? and things that you run into of obedience, that he says, this is where I'm calling you. Faith should be producing these things. Definitionally, these things should come out of faith. And so then the author gives us some case studies. So in chapter 11, we're gonna hear this idea by faith, and then there's gonna be a name attached to it, an Old Testament name. And he's gonna go through this chapter a lot. We're only gonna cover about half of them, and I'm just gonna do a flyover because I want you to see the big theme that, that I think the author's trying to teach us but we're going to see these case studies, these examples now to say, okay, if this is a definition of faith, it's these convictions and these, this confidence. Let's look at some examples. Here we go. Verse four, and I'm going to read a big chunk. I'm going to read four all the way through uh, verse 12. By faith, Abel, in the, in the Old Testament, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts and through his faith though he died he still speaks by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him now before he was taken he was commended as having pleased God and without faith it's impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as a as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And then the last little example, he says, by faith, Sarah 
who was Abraham's wife. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So here's what the author does. He defines what faith is in verses uh, 1, 2, and 3 and kind of gives this, this unpacking of, hey, here's what faith is, and, and th- there's more there in, in that. But then he starts to say, let me give you some case studies. By faith, Cain, right, and, and Abel. Abel was, was the one who was killed by Cain. Adam's kids early on in the history of the world, as these two brothers fought, it was, it was Abel who was in faith, gave the sacrifice that God said, yes, you have faith, and I see that. Enoch, right, was this one who was taken up to be with God, um, who, who was declared faithful. You have the story of Noah. You have the story of Abraham. You have the story of Sarah. Um, those stories, right, Abraham. Th- think about this. He, he built a boat, right? It was, the world is about to be flooded. He was told. And what does the passage say? It says, by God concerning Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen. He couldn't see what was coming. He was, he was building a boat when it wasn't raining, that's when Noah was building the boat, and that faith, God saw and said, yes, I told you to build the boat, and you did. Even when you couldn't see what was coming, you trusted me. And it was commended to him as righteousness, because he took those steps. He said, I trust you more than I trust what I can see. That's crazy faith. Abraham picked up his family and moved to the middle of nowhere to live in tents, because God said, this is the land I have for you. And he said, okay. He said, not knowing where he was going, Abraham did that. That's beautiful. That's powerful. Abraham did that. Sarah, who was this woman way past the childbearing age, who was told, you're going to have descendants. You're going to have sons. You're going to have eventually as many descendants as there are sands by the seashore. And that's a reference to eventually one day through that line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through David, eventually there would be the Savior would be born who would who would save the world, and that's Christ. And so this, this prophecy that Sarah was like, I don't see how this is physically possible for me, and yet believed and God provided. And, and let me point out an observation too, because if you've studied, even if you studied Noah or Abraham or Sarah, they didn't nail it, right? They, they really didn't nail it. Noah, uh, after the ark, right? I don't know if you keep reading after the story of the flood and they land and they get out and they're happy and they're cool. Noah just gets drunk and passes out in his tent, Right? Like, Noah wasn't this perfect guy in Scripture that's like, yay, cool. Like, he, no, he got totally trashed and passed down in his tent in Scripture after everything happened. Um, Abraham. Abraham, it, it talks about him here in chapter 11 as being this man of faith. But honestly, if you study Abraham, you see there was a lot of opportunities and a lot of times where Abraham did not act in faith. He gave his wife away because he was scared of kings. He would move into a a foreign country and there'd be a a king who he was really afraid of. And he'd say, hey, um, I'm afraid he's going to kill me because you're this beautiful woman. And he's a king and he's like, you know what? She's hot. I'm going to kill that guy and take her as as my wife, right? Because I guess that's what kings did back then. And so there were multiple times where Abraham would be like, hey, will you just pretend to be my sister? And then maybe like you you know, hook up with the king, but at least then I'm not in trouble, right? That was Abraham. That, that's crazy, not good. Like, that's not, that's frowned upon, right? That's heavily frowned upon. If you have a wife one day and you pretend she's um, your sister, so that you, yeah, that's weird on lots of different levels. Abraham did that. And, and still, God refers to him as faith. Sarah, his wife, referred to here as this like beacon of faith. She laughed at the angel's face. The angel said, you're going to have a kid. And she burst in laughter. And laughing at God's face is also frowned upon when he like tells you a promise. And you're like, you're an idiot. Like you, that is not what you usually should do in scripture. And yet all those people are still in this chapter, which some people call, they refer to as the hall of faith. And I want you to see some. I want you to, I want you to be mature in how you study scripture and, and see the depth of these biblical characters. Not just how Hebrews frames them as these people of faith, but also see that I really believe God sees through these lenses of grace when he sees his people. The fact that God sees Abraham and Sarah and Noah, these very imperfect people who had very imperfect stories, he says, yes, but they still had faith. 
although they were kicking and streaming and stumbling over themselves throughout their story, they had faith and they are mine and I count it to them as righteousness and look at their faith. I think you should be encouraged by that. I think you should be encouraged by that and, and look at the stories of Scripture and say, look at how God still sees through the lens of grace. He wasn't surprised. He knows exactly what they did. He knows their hearts. He knows sin that they don't even know. Yet he sees through those lens of graces, that lens of grace. And the other observation is this. Before I read this last section here in, in Hebrews um, that we're going to study this morning is they didn't actually receive it yet. Most of them. Like Abraham died before he really had the promised land fulfilled. Right? Noah, I mean, the world was in a desolate place. It wasn't like everything was great and fine. Hence probably why he got drunk in his tent. Right? After the flood, things all weren't great. And here is this ushering in this new kingdom of this new people. It was, it was hard and difficult and and, and so even Sarah, she didn't get to see all of this descendants that she was promised. And so they all died without actually seeing these promises that they were, um, they were given. Look at what verse 13 through 16 says. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Let me quickly unpack this. And there's, there's so much in this chapter. And, and, and I'm going to give you guys a flyover on some of these things. And we'll, we'll dig much deeper into some of the specific promises of God next week and, and a deeper unpacking of, of faith. But here's what I want you to see. They couldn't see it yet, but they believed. Right? They, they didn't belong yet. They were exiles. They were foreigners. They were strangers. They didn't belong in this place yet. They were, they were uncomfortable. They were like aliens in this land, right? They didn't really belong here yet, and yet they still believed. They still stayed steadfast, even through their stumbling immaturity. They still stayed steadfast to you are my God and I am yours. They couldn't see yet. And Scripture is making this really important point that I don't want us to miss they couldn't see and they believed. They didn't feel like they belonged, but they, they let their roots, the source of growth, grow deep and hold fast their roots so they would continue to grow in, in faith. And those things under the surface, those roots that, that produce the fruit of faith, they continued to stay steadfast in who God was in his promises and what, and what he had told them he would do. So what does that mean for us? Right? A apply that to your life. A couple of things. One, if you are not planted in Christ, right, this idea of if you've never truly put your faith in Christ, I'm not talking about church, I'm not talking about Christian affiliation, right, I'm not talking about emotionalism, I'm, I'm talking about if you've never truly surrendered your life to Christ, if you've never really put your faith in Him, Right, that you look at your, your behavior, uh, you look at your priorities, you look at your identity as a response to, have I put my faith in him? And you don't look at your behavior and your priorities and, and your identity and who, who you claim yourself to be based on, am I earning it? You look at it as, is this a product? And if I am in Christ, then that means my behavior, even kicking and screaming and stumbling over myself as the broken sinners that we are should be moving in a direction of God. Would I live more according to your way than my way or the world's way? And, and my priorities, God, would they be based on who you say and, and how you've called me to live as opposed to me and how I want to live and, and my priorities or the priorities the world gives me and my even identity, who I am, that everything else could crumble. Oh, wouldn't wouldn't it be amazing if we could say everything else in your world crumbles? Your friends, the social ladder you're trying to climb, the community you're in, the things you're trying to achieve, if everything else crumbles and you could still say, but I have you, I have you, you are my identity, even when everything else falls apart, that product of faith to say, I believe you, God, I want that. 
I want that for you. I want that for my five-year-old and my eight-year-old and everyone in this room and everyone watching. God, would you increase our faith? Then if you've never done that, if you've never put your faith in Christ, your sin has only given you access to a very broken kingdom that will never satisfy you. But God came to purchase you out of, through Christ, that broken kingdom at the cost of his son's death on a cross so that you might be his. Will you submit your life to Jesus? Right? Will you submit your life to Jesus and stop trying to be religious and trying to work? If you've never done that, submit your life to Christ as king and live under his rule. Live under his rule. That's what you're called to do. And it is this gracious father that says, I will forgive your sins and I will show you a life and a life abundant that I have called you to do. And he says, today, if you haven't done that today, say, God, I am tired, I am tired, I am tired. Would you take my life? Would, you, would I be a man, would I be a woman who puts their faith in you for my salvation, for their forgiveness of my sins, but for my life, that you would shape my identity, that you would shape my priorities, that my roots would go deep, that I would believe your promises, and I would study your words so that I could even know your promises? God, I believe. And if you've never done that today, don't leave this room without doing it. It's not magic words. It's not a, a, a spiritual feeling that you have to feel when the song is on. It's a choice that you get to say at the beginning of the semester, God, I don't know if I've truly put my faith in. If that's you today, I would encourage you, let us know, not so we, you can have a tally mark with your name on it, but so that we can walk with you. Because we don't want that to just be an emotional decision. We want to walk with you. So DM us or come and find me or, or one of our staff afterwards and say, hey, I am ready to put my faith in Christ, but I'm tripping over myself and I need to know what that looks like more and more and more and more. That's why we exist. That's what we do. Don't leave this room. If that's you, don't leave this room eternally unchanged. And let's say you are in Christ and you're in this room and you say, I am in Christ but it's still so freaking hard to really believe, to really find my identity, to really say, I want you and nothing else. You guys are living in a world surrounded by distractions, right? The idea that they had this faith where they couldn't see. You're surrounded by promises you can't see. A God who says, you are enough. A God who says, I created you in, in my image, which means you are worthy and beautiful. And yet we're surrounded in a culture that says, no, 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 this is what beautiful looks like. Beautiful looks like this, uh, the affirmation of another guy, another girl, that's what beauty looks like. And he says, no, no, no. Or, or he, here's what makes you valuable, and yet you live because of what your father says, and yet you live in a world that says, no, this is how you're valuable. This, you've got to achieve this. You've got to get to this place. There's so many promises that you are living in that you don't see yet. Will you hold on to his promises? in a world that is telling you a ton of lies. Roots go deep in his promises, believing in faith. God, this is who you say I am. This is who you say I am. Surrounded by environments that invite you to live in a way that you are not ultimately called to live in and that will not ultimately satisfy you. And just like these people in Hebrews chapter 11, they felt like exiles. They just felt like I don't belong in this place but I'm going to stay here. I'm going to stay planted. And God, I know some of you are sitting in a dorm room or standing in a party somewhere or in a class somewhere or in a community somewhere. And you think, God, this feels so alone. This doesn't feel like what I'm supposed to do. So you have a choice to say, well, I'm just going to do what everyone else is doing or I'm going to stand firm and say, God, in faith, would you make me resolve? Would my roots go deep? Would you produce fruit and peace and confidence and conviction and action? Would you activate that faith in me? And you can do that knowing that you have a father who loves you right where you're at. The grace of God, remember? But the grace of God calling you to something better through faith. Love you guys. Let us walk with you through that. Whatever that looks like. We continue this whole year to study his promises. Right? What are his promises? What has he said about you? Week after week after week, that's what we do. In relationships and student groups and family nights. Let us know how we can walk out his promises in your life and remind each other what is true. Let me pray for you. Father, there's so much in these verses, God. Even this idea that um, 
that's impossible to please you without faith, Lord. Um, would you give us the faith to do that? Would you give us the faith to please you? Help us believe. And God, I know I've got brothers and sisters in this room who are weary and heavy burdened and hear a sermon like this and see these stories of faith and think, gosh, that seems so far. The world I'm stuck in, the world I'm isolated in, to believe like that. Um, God, would we not just try to muster up strength and be better people? Would we run to you, even with our doubts, even for those who are not yet ready because of intellectual doubts or emotional doubts that they have? God, praise God for that. W- would they know that they can, they can bring those to you? They can bring those to Christian community as well, God, that, that you have good answers for tough questions. Um, and for those who are weary, God, would we take all of that, our doubts, our weariness, our anxieties, the areas that we feel like we don't measure up, and God, would we run to you as a father who loves us where we're at? That this call to grow, this call to go deep that you're calling us to is the call from a good and kind father that we can run to. And so, Father, would you do that work? In the name of Jesus, amen.